our ASCE YouTube channel. Let's go ahead and check that out. If you want to remember all the great things that we talked about today and share it with your friends if they weren't able to make it tonight, uh, it's a link to that is on our website under general body meetings, past meetings, something like that. But with that, I'll go ahead and say welcome to our second general body meeting of spring 2021. I push this every time. All of you are very tired of hearing about it, but I make it shorter every time I push it. National registration is super important. ASCE is a huge organization. It's not just me here at my computer talking to all of you at home. There are tons and tons of chapters just like this all around the nation. They're all managed by sections and then branches and it's, it's layers and layers and layers of students and professional civil engineers. So being a part of that is really important, uh, especially after you graduate. Lots of benefits there on the right. They give you professional development uh, credits. They're expensive, but they are sometimes required if you're going after your licensure, uh, things like that. There's a mentoring program, really important. I am or was a mentee and am now a mentor. Uh, so I know the value of a, a mentorship program and they offer that with uh, professional civil engineers, very great. There's volunteering and leadership opportunities. I know that they used to have, they still will, but because of COVID they don't, a Habitat for Humanity project that we were gonna have in the spring. That's a lot of fun. And uh, there's always networking. So that's asce.org slash membership slash student is where you can find that national registration. Maybe scoot on over there during class instead of looking at Instagram or whatever you are doing to distract yourself. So another option is to become a national member. An update on shirts. Oh my gosh, guys, we're almost there. So almost all the t-shirts that people ordered before break have been picked up. There's one more day for those people who ordered when we were considering shipping. So that first round of orders, almost everyone there has gotten their shirts. They've been picking them up this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, behind the scenes. Um, and their last day for pickup is tomorrow. So if you're one of those people, you already know who you are. Uh, please try to make it tomorrow during your assigned time slot. Uh, I've only gotten one email so far saying that they can't make it. And that's really great because we had about 30 people sending those out. So that's a great turnout. Uh, I, like, I like to avoid as many conflicts as possible because I am sitting there in my cold car getting these t-shirts to you guys. So uh, I like to see a lot of you come by and, and make use of that time. So that last day is tomorrow. And you know when, if you, if you ordered a t-shirt, you already know all that details. Um, but I'm gonna open up orders again after tomorrow. I don't know if I'm gonna open them tomorrow, um, but I'm gonna say, after they've all been picked up tomorrow, that's when we're gonna start the new ordering process. And it will go much faster than it did before break, I promise. Um, the reason it took so long is we had to figure out what we were going to do to get them to people, were we gonna ship them? And when that didn't turn out, how are we going to give them to people in person? And is it approved by the university? Are we gonna get in trouble? Now that that's all been worked out, it's gonna go a lot more smoothly. So. I envision a turnaround of a week or two weeks maximum once you once you get that order in. And there will be lots of details uh, as soon as I write that up once these initial t-shirts have been passed out. So this is gonna start going a lot more quickly than it did in the past. I'm very excited to get these two people because despite the fact that I've given a lot out, my car is now full of t-shirts instead of my closet. So I've moved the problem into a, uh, a mobile storage solution that I can take to people, but I still have to get those out to you guys. So. It's coming up. I want people to wear our t-shirts. I want you to have them. So I'm on your side. A couple of upcoming opportunities here. Um, this says join us, but this is not actually hosted by us. I just copied their little flyer. Uh, the American Waterworks Association Young Professionals is hosting an e-happy hour. They're gonna have a couple fun events there. A scavenger hunt and show and tell. Uh, they say good company. Uh, it's up to them. I, I've not met any of them, but I'm sure they're wonderful people. And that's on next Friday, February 26th at 5.30 and it's, it's virtual. So like everything these days, register ahead of time with this QR code. I'll leave this up for just a couple of seconds. If you're interested in this event, go ahead and scan that QR code and get on the registration list. But this is also in our weekly email last week, I think the week before that, and it will be on there this Sunday. So if you missed the QR code now and you wanna go back and get it later, you're not missing out. You can go ahead and click the link in our weekly email. Another one, next week is the Central Ohio Engineers Week virtual luncheon. So that's working with the Smart Cities initiative here in Columbus. Uh, they're having a meeting about all of the projects that they're working on downtown and around the city. Uh, they're pairing up with CODA for the bus systems. I think it sounds really interesting. 
I'd like to go. Uh, I will go if I can. <laughs> I've, I've registered, so as long as nothing goes wrong, I will be there. Uh, that is next Thursday as well. So that's during uh, the day, 12 to 1.30. There's another registration link, but you can't click on that because you're watching a virtual presentation. So I've included another QR code on the right that takes you to that link at the bottom, that Go Webinar register link. So I'll do this up for just a couple seconds, but it still stands just like last time. If you missed this, this is also in our weekly email. And this whole thing's recorded, so lots of chances. Okay, so with t-shirts and those two events taken care of, I'm gonna go ahead and pass things off to Carlos Vasquez. He's our speaker for this week, for this month rather. Uh, he's a PE and a structural engineering manager at WD Partners, and he's part of the American Society of Civil Engineers Central Ohio section. And he's, I won't steal his thunder, but he's gonna be talking to us about designing for seismic engineering, structural engineering. It sounds very exciting. So I'm excited to hear from it. And Carlos, uh, take it away. We can't hear you. Yeah, I think you're unmuted now. I'm sorry, I got two there you go. buttons. <laughs> a physical one and a virtual one. Understood. Yes. Can everybody see my first screen? No, you got to start sharing again because I canceled yours when I started my presentation. Oh, all right. All right. I'll play again. How about now? Yes, it looks perfect. All right. Well, Dan and, and the ASC student chapter and uh, SEO student members as well, if they're here, thank you for inviting me to come talk to you about a little bit of what I do. Um, as I mentioned, as Dan mentioned, I'm a structural engineer, I'm a manager, my current position is a manager at WD Partners here in Dublin. Uh, I've been a structural engineer for, almost 26 years. I've been licensed since a long time ago. I'm licensing in, in many jurisdictions in the US, actually it's like 46 or 47. And also I'm licensing Canada in the Alberta province. Every now and then uh, our company do some work in Canada. So um, Something that you should be aware of is that ASCE, is the Central Ohio section, it's uh, this is our 100 years anniversary this year. We were funded in 1921. Uh, we are planning a couple of events, but it's still early in the year. So a couple of announcements before we jump into the technical aspect of the presentation. <clears throat> As Dan mentioned, we have Engineers Week luncheon next week. Uh, and and uh, please, it should be a very good uh, presentation. Other than Mandy Bishop and Joanna Pickerton, uh, we have the director of Auto this week also to talk a little bit as well. So a lot of good information. Uh, on the structural engineer side, Structural Engineer Association of Ohio, there's a webinar at the same time for snow drift for students, but that seminar it's uh, about 20 minutes long. So as soon as you're done, you can join us at the engineers week. Um, other events that may may uh, you may find interesting, there's a, a, a ethics topic in March. And also there's a tour, a virtual tour of the Cruz Stadium. We were able to uh, to have the engineers doing that stadium, uh, HNTV, they're going to do a presentation. That's in April. It's not on this slide, but those that like golf, June 18 is the ASC annual golf outing. Uh, so a lot of activities, even though everybody is still uh, at home. So my last slide for events is that this past week, ASC Central Ohio released the Ohio's uh, report card for infrastructure. Uh, we got a combined GPA of C minus. Uh, go to this website, infrastructurereportcard.org slash Ohio to get the full report. As you can see, there's a lot of opportunities to, uh, to for improvement. 
And since you are kind of almost graduating, we're hoping that you will be in charge of that in the next few years. Uh, it said the previous the previous card was released in 2007, so uh, it's been a while since we got one. Now ASC National is releasing theirs later this year as well, so infrastructure is going to become a very a very good topic to talk about the next few months and years. Okay, for today, um, we're going to talk a little bit about architectural um, system components in buildings. We're going to talk a little bit about IBC and ASC 7 provisions. Those are the building codes that are uh, related to building design. Also, we're going to have a quick overview of some architectural components in commercial buildings. It's a lot of good photos and, and, and things that uh, you will find very interesting next time you go to, to a commercial building and start looking at. Uh, I mean, structural engineer by, by education, I'm, I've been working on that most of my life. And one of the things that I develop a habit is that every time I go to a building, the first thing I look is up, see how the building is framed. Uh, and I start looking at how the calm connections are. So I, it, it's odd, but I think it's a good habit though. Uh, well, we structural engineers, we make sure that the buildings are safe and to some extent useful. And I'll talk more about that later. Uh, the designers of architectural and system components, that we mechanical, engineer, electrical, uh, plumbing, refrigeration, fire protection, they rely, they rely on the building. They need to make sure that what they're installing it's properly anchored to the building and also takes into account the building behavior. And that's what we're going to talk about this, uh, this few slides tonight. Uh, here, let me give you a good example. Uh, here, this is a photo of a building that was in construction uh, 2010, Oof, the date is there. And uh, a little bit before opening, Opening day. This is the. This was a grocery store in uh, in New York, by the way. You see this metal stud wall, this partition wall, that it's close to the top. It's it's shy. It's not it's not up there yet. Uh, what happened is that there was a big snowstorm a few weeks before they were ready to open, and the roof because of the snow started deflecting. Right. And some of the components, as you can see here, start pushing the structure down. The, the, not the structure, the structure moved down. So it's pushing the components, in this case, a partition. And you may think that's okay. It's, you know, it's above the ceiling. Nobody's going to see that. But the problem is that the roof keeps pushing down. Things like this start to happen. You start seeing, uh, problems with the finishes, you start seeing the walls uh, buckling out of playing. And that continued for a little bit more. So uh, it got so bad that the contractors started to use tape to keep things together while the repair was devised. So imagine this happening right before opening. So, and this is a customer facing area. So you don't want to see that. And we'll talk about what to do to avoid this in a few slides. Another big concern is seismic earthquake loads, seismic event, um, you know, violent shaking. As you can see from this map, is very the West Coast is on fire. You can see the this is the purplish color, and so it's a big concern in the West Coast. So states like California, uh, Washington, Oregon. Um, to some extent, Nevada as well, they are very prepared for this. So their building cost has been threatened to, uh, to account for seismic events. But for us, the people here in the Midwest, we have a couple more uh, faults closer to us, especially the New Madrid fault in, um, in the western side of uh, Tennessee and Kentucky. Uh, you can see there's a small couple of areas in dash green here in Ohio, 
because we do expect some, we do feel a few movements here and there. They're not as strong as near the uh, seismic fault, but uh, in the in the northwest portion of the state, there's some shaking. Uh, so we'll talk about that. Now, let me show you a quick video of how manufacturers uh, tend to visualize what's going on and researchers and engineers, how, how, they, how they can see what's going on. Because one of the things about such events is that they happen for a few minutes, but then there's nothing else to look at. So through the years, universities and, and several corporate uh, entities, they develop, uh, the, this is a shake table. This is a big one, by the way. As far as I remember, Ohio State has one, but it's very tiny compared to this. So uh, so the, the way this thing works is that they uh, they feed the motors, the ser ser serbs, servos, and make this thing shake, simulating a, a recorded event from a from a past earthquake. I believe they use uh, El Centro for this one. So as you can see, that's that particular seismic event, uh, how long it lasted, just, you know, a few seconds to a minute and so. A uh, couple of things, you, you did notice that what we were testing here is a ceiling assembly, uh, acoustic ceiling tiles, you can see all of them fell down, right? Because of the violent movement, but you can see the, the light fixtures they're still hanging. They're not, they didn't stay in place. They fell down, but they're hanging. And uh, that's one of the things that come from this kind of research. So in building codes, in uh, material codes, there are provisions that in high seismic areas, like features need to be tied to the ceiling grid with either small chains, with wires, because uh, you don't want those things falling on people. The ceiling tiles, well, you know, it's a piece of cardboard. So is the, the, the possibility of that thing uh, fatally injuring somebody is very low. Not with, not with the lights. The lights are heavy, the lights are metal, they have uh, sharp edges. So in high seismic regions, there are provisions that you need to add it to your drawings that these things need to be properly uh, accounted for. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, we continue talking. Um, architectural components on buildings. As you, uh, we already talk about wall partitions. Sometimes they are full height. Sometimes they are partial height. Uh, ceilings, storefronts, uh, cladding, especially around the state of the building. Uh, shelving units, storage racks. Think like Home Depot big storage racks. Uh, merchandising features, you know, the reaching you got to grab uh, food in the grocery store. Uh, material storage, especially for chemicals or hazardous. This is mostly in uh, in um, industrial facilities. Computers racks, server racks. Nowadays, if you go into a, 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 any business, you see there are one or more room dedicated to computer racks, to server racks and they're stuck and they're tall and they are can be heavy. Uh, cardboard balers and equipment like that for compressing trash, com compressing cardboard. Uh, and this is just a, a, few, a short list, the thing that you may have seen as you walk around. Uh, now, why we care about uh, components and not just the building? Because it's a given that we as engineers, we design buildings, or at least the people that the building. But we make sure the building is properly signed. We follow the lateral, the, the, the load path for lateral loading, for, for vertical loading. But it's important that we keep an eye 
and we advise architects, we advise mechanical and electrical engineers, we advise owners uh, about um, non-structural components. One of them is because it can become a life safety issue. Uh, as you can see from these photos, somebody can get killed if a bookshelf falls on them, no? It's not a structural element, it's not part of the building even, but we need to be able to advise the owner, hey, you need to anchor that thing at the top so it doesn't tip over, especially in high seismic regions. The same to the photo on the right, that's a, that looks like a warehouse kind of facility. And everything came down. And again, if you are in the middle of the aisle, you don't you don't have a way to escape those things. So that's why we want to make sure those are designed properly to minimize these kind of issues. Um, property damage as well. Um, it can be expensive. You know, you see all the damage from a seismic event, from a hurricane it may mean that the building has, the owners have no means to reopen the building after the fact. So by, by small changes to the way we design things, by small changes to the way things are installed in the field, we can minimize those expenses. And another issue is operations. Imagine you have a hospital, imagine you have a fire station and there are no communications because during a, hurricane during a seismic event, the dish antennas on the roof were blown out. Like that photo in the center of the screen. Or the water pipes were damaged like that photo on the left. And so there's no water in the building. It may be fine for a, for a one story building, but imagine you're in a tower that is 30, 30, 30 stories tall. So that's another reason why we need to keep an eye on these things. We need to advise our clients, our owners, and building codes, they do have provisions for all these kinds of things. Uh, the photo, the small photo in the, in the, at the bottom, at the center bottom, it shows a fire sprinkler head. If the fire, if the fire protection system is not working, it's, it's, it's also increases the risk of fire not being able to be in doused out. So again, it may be fine on a one-story building where people can just run out the door, but imagine you are in a skyscraper that is a hundred story store. See, it's uh, that's why we need to take care of non-structural um, components. And we as engineers, and we as structural engineers have the knowledge to advise uh, and to design those systems. We are not responsible for designing the fire protection system, but we can advise them, hey, you need to brace it here and here and here. You need to anchor it to the wall at this point. You need to use, uh, a, there's expansion joint in this building, so you need to use a flexible connection here. Uh, and talking about that, we may not notice because buildings are big, because buildings are, uh, they look rigid, they, but they buildings move a lot. They move a lot because of the loading. Like for example, that example of the snow roof deflecting, just the sun hitting them, the cold weather at night, the building spots, uh, expands and contracts. So those kind of things we need to coordinate as well. We don't want a building cladded in brick full of cracks people will not enter that building because they get scared. So in order to avoid that, we have to design the brick, as an example, uh, to be able to move independently of the building. The same with wood. Uh, the next slide. Uh, here I have just an example of how we do that, the brick, is attached to the building with these kind of clips. They're called, uh, they're called masonry ties, by the way. And these, as you can see, the, because of the shape, they allow that brick to move up and down and sideways, so moving plane because of changes in thermal, in thermal properties. Not changes in thermal properties, changes due to thermal 
issues when the sun hit it or cold at night. Uh, but the wind, when it tries to suck that or push that, cannot do that. So this is a connection that allows in-plane movement, but does not restrict the out-of-plane movement. Now, and this is the last thing I'm going to mention about the exterior uh, envelope, because this is a very big topic. In the future, I'll be more than happy to come back and talk a little bit about this topic. Uh, it's very, very interesting and, and, and it's, it involves a lot of things. But today we're going to talk a little bit more about what we do when the roof deflects, you know, those big beams, uh, those big bar joists, they do deflect their loading, especially snow accumulation, snow, uh, snow drift, uh, which is snow piling against the walls, against the parapets, ice that's heavy. Just dead and light, just by some way starts deflecting. Life loading, which is usually is a considered a construction load. Um, wind pressure, the wind can suck the, the roof up or down. Uh, and of course, seismic events. Those are violent vertical movements uh, and horizontal as well. The same for lateral building subjected to wind pressure and earthquakes can move. They move up and down, they move sideways, um, and we need to account for that. Okay, moving on. Let's talk a little bit about building codes. In the US, the International Building Code is, the, uh, is what we call the model code. The people at the International Code Council publish this code every three years. And it's up to states to take the code, modify it if they see fit, and then publish it. Then it becomes a legal document. There's not a national level code in the US. It's a state by state uh, mandate. In Canada, it's at the provincial level. So uh, it's not really like, seven provinces, six, seven provinces, so there's not that much variation. But the, one of the big issues in, in the US is that not every state changes code at the same time. For example, Florida adopted the 2018 version of the code this past January. California did a year ago. Ohio, we're still using the 2017 Ohio Building Code, which is based on the 2015 edition of the International Building Code. And the other important call for design loads is the ASC 7. In this case, this photo, I have ASC 710, which is the one that goes along with 2015 IBC. The current edition, the 2018 IBC, uses ASC 716. ASC publishes ASC 7 every six years. IBC is, is published every three years. Uh, this is the, the, the way that it works is that uh, these codes are called by reference. So IBC calls ASC 7. So ASC 7 becomes part of the code by reference, the same with the steel and, 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 and concrete codes. Something very important to notice about this topic is that the code, building code and the loading codes are, uh, their main concern is life safety. So, so for, for uh, there's some damage to the building, as long as that building didn't collapse, most likely you could say that that building was successful in its implementation of the building code provisions. That's the whole purpose of building code. The building code IBC is include uh, Life safety provisions, they have a structure life safety provision, but also have like fire requirements, accessibility requirements, uh, and some energy requirements in the last few of the codes. But the mandate of the code has always been the same, protection of life, okay? Uh, a little bit about the chapter, chapter, the structure chapter, start at chapter 16, and go all the way to chapter 23. And uh, each of these codes, when there are a material code like the 
concrete, aluminum, mercury, they reference their own separate code. So again, these codes become law by reference. They're not published, otherwise the code would be this thick. As those have already seen the, the steel design manual is quite thick. And there are two of them because there's a second one for seismic. The same for ACI code for concrete, the same for wood. Uh, the American Wood Council publishes the national design specification. And also these codes, they change every few years too. So a lot takes a lot to, to stay up to date. Uh, the building code, uh, classifies buildings in four categories, four risk categories. Risk category four is essential facilities, hospitals, fire stations, post uh, event shelters. Uh, risk category three are buildings uh, usually high occupancy, restaurants, banquet halls, facilities that uh, schools a lot of times that can be used as shelters in the case of emergencies. Most commercial buildings and residential buildings are risk category two. And the least category, risk category one, are buildings with low risk to human life, usually agricultural barns, a storage shed in the back of your house. Uh, those are usually risk category one. Uh, the reason for this is the way we apply code provisions and two, the way we apply safety factors. So you can have the same shear wall, the same moment frame this for risk category four, you would have, you have to apply a safety factor bigger than risk category two or three. Uh, a little bit about more about seismic. Seismic events are, are, are um, ground motion related. So the ground shakes, the plate tectonic shake, or move around and release pressure. And that movement as the wave travels, releases horizontal and, and, and vertical uh, shock waves that once they get to the surface, that's when they hit buildings. Uh, these are inertial forces. So the heavier the building, the more punishment it will get. And uh, Actually, building codes, you know, every time there's a big event, a big, a big uh, disaster, building code people learn a lot from them. And one of the things, for example, is the vertical motion in earthquakes. We learned that hard lesson in uh, 1994 um, Norwich earthquake. Before that, the building code only dealt with horizontal motions. So after 1994, uh, Norwich, that when seism seismometers and, and just by looking at structures that people realize that there's also vertical movement. So now more current codes, they include vertical movement provisions. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a guideline, uh, the seismic design categories that one through four are assigned by uh, seismic sand categories are assigned based on risk. And actually there are five seismic sand categories and there are letters A through F. Uh, depending on the location, ground shaking potential and also the soil conditions. Uh, and the reason for soil conditions is because when you have a seismic wave traveling through the soil, if the soil, for example, it's uh, hard rock, I mean, solid rock, like in Missouri, uh, that wave keeps traveling. So there's very little that goes vertical to the surface, but you have a soil that is highly in clay, uh, that kind of soft, that the waves cannot travel faster. So if, you, if the wave slows down, that's when you start feeling the effects in the surface. For a reference, Ohio, most buildings in Ohio are, are, are seismic design category B. Missouri is C because even though they have the New Madrid seismic fault nearby, it's rock all over the place in that region. So the, the, the seismic event just keeps traveling and dissipating. Uh, California, D, E, and F, uh, 
And uh, and Missouri can be against COD, for example. It, it, go, it all depends on the soil. If your new building sitting on, on rock, you may be okay. If you are sitting on a softer soil, that building probably will need to be designed for better seismic um, detailing. Uh, I'm almost done with the code stuff. Uh, no structural elements. Uh, for again, the idea is to minimize life uh, danger, but loss of functionality is also taking care a little bit, um, especially in, 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 in risk categories three and four. Those are the kind of building that we want to survive an event. We want them to survive a seismic event or in the Easter Coast, a hurricane. <clears throat> so, the design of those components that we're going to talk next, um, they also have safety factors for anchorage. Um, and, and is because of that realization. If you have a hospital, again, survive and is designed with a applicable safety factor, but does not survive, this water does not have water, does not have electricity, uh, all, the, all the fixtures are over the place, that building is not useful. So it's not just the building, it's also these contents or its components. So that's why we also assign safety factors for the components that are different from the building design safety factors. A good example is fire protection. Fire protection uh, sprinklers, for example, water pipes, they tend to have a higher safety factor than let's say ceilings. Again, the ceiling can fall down, people can still after a little bit of cleanup, they may be able to use the building. But if the fire uh, protection system is not operating, that uh, becomes a problem. Carlos, uh, just a gentle reminder, five minutes left on the time. I don't want to rush you, but I just want you to be aware. Oh, OK, so I'll move on then. This is very important. Um, the question on chapter 13 of ASC 7 is an equation that accounts the things that we talk about. There are factors for how flexible the building is. There are factors for where it is located. There are factors of how ductile the building is. And the, there are factors, again, that importance factor there. And also we, we realize that a component that is on the first floor is not going to receive as much punishment as a equipment on the roof. So for example, you have equipment on the roof, C over H becomes one, H is the total building height and C is the height of whatever. That becomes three. The same component on the ground floor, this becomes zero, so it becomes one. So even the location within the building matters. Okay, now the cool pictures. Uh, how we fix the snow issue, the roof deflection, we use things like slide clips. As you can see, the studs are cut a little bit shorter. And we install slots or tracks with slots that allow the roof or floor to move up and down. Here's another example. Another example is a double track. So as you can see, the auto plane is restrained, the wall will not fall down, but still allows the building to move up and down, okay? Uh, other ways to do that is just, you know, stopping the wall short and bracing them. Uh, let's keep that one. This is a, a photo of bracing for ceilings to minimize that movement, that shaking, every few feet, you just put lateral bracing and a compression strut. Uh, and you do that, there's prescription the code that say like every 12 feet. Uh, here's a photo of a compression pose and bracing, and you try to minimize that movement. Here's a schematic. For those interested, I have seen some resources. If you are if you are interested, I can forward you these uh, these links later on. Storage racks. Again, we don't want that rack to fall over somebody, so we anchor them to the walls. We anchor them to the ground and design them like frames. You see that bracing is designed as a structure by itself. We want to avoid this. 
uh, fire protection, we brace connections to the roof. Every time there's a change in elbow, we brace it as well. Uh, sometimes we provide flexible connections at joints so that thing can move without damaging the building. The same for duct work from HVAC. FEMA publishes a good guide on this. FEMA documents, by the way, are government documents that are free. Actually, they're paid by your parents' taxes, but they have a good information available. Water tanks, the same. We anchor them to a wall. See them top and bottom? Uh, that's all I have. Uh, um, I know that I talk a little bit fast because of the time constraint, but any of you have a question, uh, please let me know. Uh, it doesn't have to be right now, of course. If you, you need my contact information, I'll be more than glad to answer your questions. All right, Dan. Awesome, Carlos. Yeah, we'll forward Carlos's contact information um, after this meeting. And I'll also put it in the description of this video for anybody who's watching it after the fact. So they can reach out to you guys with any questions. Carlos, thank you so much. That was awesome. Oh, I'm glad I could bring, like bring a topic your... like this to this audience. Uh, again, pay attention to the little details. That's the, that's the lesson. Excellent. Okay, so I have three points to close this out for today. Um, an important one for those of you who are part of Concrete Canoe or the environmental teams, uh, OVSC registration is this week, this Friday, if you'd like a t-shirt for that. So if you're here from your team captains for Concrete Canoe or environmental teams, uh, make sure you get on that real quick if you want a t-shirt, uh, but that's only for some of you. Uh, I hope everybody had a good career fair last Wednesday and got some stuff out of that. I know I certainly did. It was very exciting. And our next general body meeting is Wednesday, March 10th. Um, so just watch out for that next month. You'll see it in our weekly email. Um, but that's all I have for you guys. Officers, stick around. And again, Carlos, thanks so much. Pleasure you guys enjoy your night. You